Uh, welcome to uh, our public satirist talk with Thomas Cowan. Um, welcome to folks online, welcome to folks in the room. Uh, we're also getting used to our hybrid split audiences spread across uh, in this way, but we'll proceed. Uh, my name is Gautam Bhan. I'm faculty here at IHS in Bangalore. And it is my pleasure today to just introduce Tom, uh, who's come and we have the great pleasure of having him here to talk about his new book. Um, so let me introduce uh, Thomas Cowan is Assistant Professor in Geography at the University of Nottingham. His research interests focus on the geographies of extended urbanization, uh, property making and labor politics. His work has been published in several academic and public outlets, including Antipode, Iger and Open Democracy. And his book, which is going to be the subject of today's talk, is called Subaltern Frontiers, Agrarian City Making in Gurgaon, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. And his new work is on property digitization uh, yeah. in some ways, which I hope we'll talk about a bit later as yeah. well, come up in the book a little bit. So in terms of the format, just to give you a sense, um, I've known Tom for a number of years now, and he's been uh, in Delhi for almost a decade, I think, doing yeah. work, I think, at this point. So really has been able to also see Gurgaon not just as a kind of snapshot at this moment, but as it emerged um, in what, to use your word, the extended urbanization of the national capital region. Um, so I think that the second, both the question of thinking about how our urban regions are growing into their edges and peripheries is a subject not just of urban theory debate in India, but actually quite globally, and right? it's been for some time. So I feel like there is really a, it's a very timely question to think about how urbanization occurs as cities grow, right? And the the distinction between when we stop thinking of the region and think of Gurgaon as its own town, its own center versus an extension of Delhi versus our older language of satellite towns and edge cities and Desakotas and peri-urban regions, all these attempts to hold what this edge looks like really? um, in some ways. And I think that in, in many ways, the other just framing I wanted to give before I hand over to Tom is to also think that recently in Indian urban studies, there's been a real interest in the return in some way of the agrarian question in urban studies. And I think that, um, you know, counter to a lot of debates around, say, planetary urbanization, one of the assertions against planetary urbanization actually has been to say, to push back against a certain writing out of the rural, to actually say, and I'm yeah. thinking of Sai Balakrishnan's work, Shubha Gururani's work, work that has really said, the agrarian is central to the urban in India. You cannot think of the urban without the agrarian, yeah. right? And, and it's not an ad rural and stir kind of moment, but yeah. to really think of it as foundational. And I think in many ways, the fact that Tom's talk today is called agrarian city making, um, which in one way you could read almost as an ironic yeah. juxtaposition, right? <laughs> a strange paradoxical question. But I think actually, um, it's a pleasure particularly to have you here, because I feel like this is such a timely question about urban theory that very much comes from India in mm -hmm. some ways and very much comes from the South in some ways, you know, and I think um, so it gives us an articulation of a broader idea of thinking from the South that, yeah. you know, m many of our students are in the room here have been engaging in this idea of what it means to think from the South. The idea of the agrarian city making. So I'm going to pretend we schedule this talk as part of my pedagogical okay. brilliance and simultaneity, which is totally not true. Uh, but I think it couldn't come at a better time for me between class today and class okay. tomorrow. So I'm particularly <laughs> interested in that. Um, so cool. the format of the of the form today is that we're going to hand over to Tom, who's going to talk at length about the book and take us through it. Um, I will keep a couple of questions, uh, reserving right of chair, and then open it up to the floor, including for folks online. Um, uh, folks online, we are using the Q&A function. Um, so just because it's webinar format, so don't use the chat function in Zoom because we don't get to see it then. So please use the Q&A box and uh, please hold your questions until the end of the talk. You can feel free to put them in at any time, but we will look at them at the end of the talk. Um, folks in the room, just a reminder, phones on silent um, and just to uh, think, and then please join me in welcoming Tom to IHS. And it's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. Go? Over your talk. Great. Can I be heard? Yes? Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much, um, first of all, to everyone um, at IIHS for facilitating this discussion. Um, thanks to Prajna and others for 
um, facilitating my, my arrival here uh, and my time so far. It's a real um, privilege to be able to speak, um, speak here today. IIHS is like, in many ways, a kind of holy grail for urbanists. You know, we have followed the development of this institution, learned a huge amount from um, of the al academic output, intellectual output um, from IHS through journals like Urbanization. Um, and actually much of that intellectual work that Gorton was re referring to in, a, in this kind of agrarian urban studies has been staged in that journal. Um, but of course there's this kind of broader pedagogical project which is a uh, constant inspiration. So it's a real, real privilege to be here. Um, it's actually also quite funny because um, I don't know if you remember Gorton, but like 2011, 12, I was just starting out on this project and it began life as a kind of labor studies. I was, I was interested, in the, interested in the labor geographies of Gurgaon. If you remember 2011, 12, there were this it was a really vibrant moment of labor politics in Gurgaon's industrial states with these factory occupations. So I was, I was really drawn to the city through that channel and thinking about, okay, what, what, what's, a, what's this kind of very, in many ways, trad labor politics doing in an otherwise kind of privatized um, kind of neoliberal, quote unquote, urban, urban form. And I was trying to make my way into the land question. I actually managed to get five minutes of Gautam. I was like, I was like um, you know what, I'm, I think it's something about speculation. I think it's all speculation, speculative land markets in Gilgal. And I really remember Gautam saying to me, yeah, but is it? Are you sure? Maybe it's not. And, uh, <laughs> and that was a really important methodological lesson, this kind of moment that st stayed with me. I mean, it turns out it was it is speculation, but but the point is that no, it's not. The point is that you know, um, what I've always tried to do and what I try and do in this book is really to not move into our field work with already sort of prefigured concepts in our pockets, right? Um, to you know, to to take perhaps the framework of speculation, but then really to investigate, interrogate its its kind of contingent forms. Um, to be open to kind of uncertainty that, the, that these kind of sites and fields throw up. So I'm especially grateful for that. Um, so what I thought I'd do in this presentation um, is just give you kind of an overview of the book, the book's main argument, where it's um, the kind of uh, debates that it's engaged in. Um, and what I'll do, I thought I'd do is I'd give you three kind of iterations of what I refer to as agrarian city making in the book. And they're drawn from... Three, three of the middle chapters in the book. So in a way, if you are interested in any of them, you can just go to the chapter rather than reading the whole book. Um, and then I'll give some conclude, conclude, um, conclusionary remarks. Um, OK, so the book, Subaltern Frontiers, um, it principally examines the rapid urbanization of the Haryana countryside from around 1981 uh, when the first development license was issued to D DLF um, to develop a, a residential um, uh, estate on the edges of Delhi to around 2014, 2015. And during that period, over 35,000 acres of rural and agricultural land were acquired, aggregated and converted for real estate and industrial purposes. So in a sense, the book is not in any way intended to be a definitive account of the city of Gurgaon or urbanization in Gurgaon. There is so much going on in the kind of rural and urban worlds of Gurgaon, um, just like any city that, you know, the book is not, not an attempt to capture everything. Rather, it's aimed to scrutinize sort of two key problematics, which I view as driving the expansion of the um, city over the um, last 40 years and also configuring and, and distorting that spatial production. The first being the labor question, which I've kind of referred to already. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, um, but I'll kind of make reference to it. And if you have questions about labor, we can um, address those in the Q&A. And the second uh, takes up what some has re have referred to and uh, uh, what was um, uh, foregrounded before is the, the agrarian land question or the land question. So how exactly does the state and private sector go about buying up, aggreg aggregating, converting vast swathes of agricultural land held under quite complex tenure, tenure arrangements and to transform it into an investable resource property. How was the Haryana countryside so convincingly turned 
for real estate-led urbanisation? And what are the political, social, cultural grounds upon which that project was realised and then in many ways, in many ways not realised as well? So the two things that you might probably may already know about Gauguin, the first is that is the, um, what makes the Gauguin story a little bit unique is the, the leading role that the private sector played in land acquisition, um, planning and service delivery. So what's known as the Gauguin model, which was a, really an elaboration of a planning, um, planning legislation in the 70s, bestows power to private firms to acquire and convert land, establish residential colony, colonies and provide basic services within controlled areas. So this was seen as a prototype, a blueprint for public-private partnerships in, in greenfield urban development. It was kind of celebrated as such throughout the 90s and 2000s. So what's different in Gauguin to many other kind of uh, development projects of its kind is that it's not the state that's going in and acquiring land en masse um, through uh, land acquisition proceedings, eminent domain, but rather the private sector that's engaged, engaging in the market to, to transfer land. The second characteristic that's often attributed to Gauguin is uh, that amidst this large, this vast transformation of land, there's been very, there's been overall very little um, opposition of the traditional kind that we expect to see and read within the kind of canons of, of urban studies. Very little opposition from landowning communities to this quite vast transformation, right? So the book aims to, in many ways, sort of complicate and satirize mainstream accounts of uh, Gauguin's urbanization and kind of ex expanded urbanization in general. On the one hand, we have this story advanced by actors like DLF and consultancy firms and others of Gauguin as this sort of new urban India, an example of what's possible when the state steps aside and allows the, the market to, to more efficiently allocate resources uh, in land. The second analogous account is advanced um, largely within critical urban scholarship that views Gauguin, sorry, views Gauguin as one expression, as an example of an already existing global trend of urbanization, where finance and real estate capital, urban land use, and municipal jurisdiction are imposed cleanly upon local context. In these accounts, the agrarian, the rural, the non-urban are simply sites where urbanization plays out. They're always already prefigured as sites of dispossession, marginality. And in a, in a way, Gauguin is not treated, Gauguin is a, is a site where you would go to test your urban concepts, but not a site which itself produces any um, urban concepts. It's not a site to theorize from, it's a, it's a site to kind of uh, test already conceived understandings. So the central arg argument of the book um, is that Gauguin's urbanization is fundamentally agrarian. That is that the explosive transformation of land in the region since the 80s has principally been brokered and mediated through a series of alliances and compromises with agrarian institutions, social relations, and territories. That is the expansion of real estate markets across the, the, air, the region has been reliant not on the elimination of agrarian uh, social structure or on land's existing social and legal uses, but rather on a more complex enlistment of the agrarian world into projects of city making, what I call in the book agrarian city making. And agrarian city making is in one sense an economic or, or material project. It relies upon the distribution of ground rents and the ceding of territory and power to agrarian institutions in exchange for access to land. It's reliant upon agrarian actors' practical knowledge and control over land tenure systems and institutions, uh, which are central to the processes of land assembly and conversion that, that real estate firms uh, require. And it also involves the incorporation of agrarian institutions into the development and fi financing of real estate projects. So this kind of land pooling model, equity partnership model that's quite common now in uh, land assembly projects, a lot of that was sort of experimented in the 1970s and 80s by, these de by developers like DLF, um, who went into partnership with um, agrarian communities in order to access land. <clears throat> 
Um, the second iteration, sorry, but agrarian city making is also an ideological project, right? It's one that has called on Harry Anvi farmers and kind of rural residents to view themselves not as farmers, not um, necessarily as juts or as, or as farm workers, but rather as a, an emerging class of rentiers, brokers and investors, a new asset class. And to view their rural land with all its diverse uses and meanings and tenure arrangements strictly as a value generating real estate asset. So the book explores how this ideological project circulates across public discourse through the city, where urban development, uh, um, so you can see this kind of ideology within urban development plans, in court judgments, in district and municipal directives, which repeat this story uh, of land's magical value, but also of land's only sensible use as real estate. As real estate. Finally, importantly, agrarian city making, as I discussed throughout the book, is no one way street, right? It requires the ceding of power, rents, territories to agrarian communities with, and those, those communities, those actors may not have the equivalent ambitions, aims, um, imaginaries for, um, for urban and agrarian development as firms do. So on one hand, of course, this this brokerage of the urban and agrarian world has, I argue across the book, enabled this expansion of real estate to happen. But it also provides a source of a great deal of frustration, obstruction, um, and the production of quite other rural and urban geographies. Right? So it's, it's a provisional settlement that has to constantly be remade, um, on, on, often on political and cultural grounds. Indeed, Gauguin, like much, um, so I'm getting my paper all mixed up. Gauguin, like much exp expanded urbanization in the, in the region in the contemporary moment, is characterized not by a smooth, uninterrupted expansion of real estate and infrastructure, the kind of bypass urbanization that um, Kelly and Sanyal and um, Rajesh Bhattacharya have written about, but rather by a more patchwork geography of rural and, and urban land, um, of privatized and communal land systems, of rural and urban institutions, of rents and capital, that yes, have produced the landscape which we might think of as gl characteristically global in, in, in its sort of um, forms of real estate development, but it's also produced holdouts, um, infrastructure projects that are rerouted around uh, uh, villages, development projects that are stalled by bureaucratic intransigence, panchayat led development programs, what Carol uh, Apudiai has recently referred to as empty urbanization. So, agrarian city making is my attempt to try and get at these uneven and provisional agrarian urban geographies that are, that are both enabling and constricting forms of uh, development in, in Gugaon. Um, as was mentioned, this book as such is situated within a much broader body of scholarship, largely drawn um, from, from India, and that loosely coalesces around what Shubhaguru Rani has referred to as agrarian urbanism. And this body of work, I mean, just speaking in general about it, has sought to get to grips with social sp spatial transformations in peripheral and peri-urban spaces, and pays, pays particular attention to the entanglement of emerging real estate and infrastructural forces with the politics of agrarian land, of land tenure arrangements, of the histories of caste-structured property regimes, um, and of and the kind of the uneven development of agrarian capitalism in these different conjunctures. At stake in much of this work, is to, it appears to be how exactly we pass the agrarian and the urban, how we conceptualize their encounter, how much currency we give ostensibly powerful and global development actors, and how quickly we relegate the multitude of cultural, social, and everyday circuits of value that continue to dominate rural and non-urban spaces. Um, you know, there's, as already, already been alluded to, there's a section of urban studies that very confidently prescribes a priori the determinacy of urban land use and political economy and private property um, onto sites like these, um, largely drawn from a reading of urbanization elsewhere, right? A more authoritative reading of urbanization elsewhere within more authoritative sites. 
This kind of approach is often very quick to view these forms of land transformation as inaugurated through the imposition of market capitalism and subsequent processes of dispossession. Work that um, Solomon Benjamin notes flattens and closes over various political spaces and bypasses uh, the multiple logics of territorial formation that come to shape urban regions here in India. So for me, not only does this approach necessarily foreclose these distinct circuits and imaginaries that exist in rural areas, I think it also mystifies the complex work that's required to turn social formations for urban expansion. Urban real estate geographies do not, for everyone, solely arrive by the bulldozer. Right? They, to, to use uh, Tanya Murray Lee's uh, phrase, it requires complex cultural, political, material work to build consensus for this form of mass transformation. Indeed, in order to, to, to really get at and understand these forms of urbanization requires doing away with approaches that view urbanization as always already realized, and rather attend to the provisional sites and negotiations through which attempts to repurpose the rural world are realized or sometimes not realized. So in, 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 very briefly, in, in the book, I, um, I conceptualize the agrarian urban drawing on um, cultural theorist Stuart Hall's work um, as an articulation. This is an articulation that requires attention to how, within a particular conjuncture, urban development mandates, capital discourses become entangled with and dependent upon agrarian institutions, and in doing so, settle these provisional geographies. What I find really useful about this approach, this approach of articulation, is that um, it refuses a simple one-way determination, right, where, urban, where the urban comes to structure all under its control and grasp and rather pushes us to attend to the political and cultural work required to settle these landscapes. To focus on how exactly and on what grounds these cultural, territorial, and political economic formations come together and indeed sometimes fall apart. Um, in other words, to propose, the book tries to propose a methodology of understanding urbanization, again borrowing from Stuart Hall, without guarantees, right? Open to the fraught and provisional reworking of these kinds of agrarian urban alliance that we find in places like Gugal. Very briefly, the other kind of analytic that I draw on in the book is this subaltern analytic. Um, and for me, the subaltern analytic is a way of understanding um, formations of power where subordinated actors or sub sub subordinated relations are absorbed and enlisted into dominant projects, but they're never fully el eliminated. And it's that, that partial absorption that allows for uh, those subordinated actors to kick back, to reroute projects, to, to re reimagine um, these kind of development geographies. Saying that, um, I should say that I'm aware that the, the term subaltern is used differently. Right? And, it, and it, when I was, uh, when the book was being reviewed, lots of the reviewers were like, are you sure you want to go down the subaltern route? Because you're going to get loads of kickback. So it, I don't use it, and I'm not for a moment saying that elite dominant agricultural communities in Gurgaon are the subaltern. I don't use the term to refer to a sociological identity. What I'm trying to get at is a relationship of difference where those subsumed, those subordinated actors are not fully dominated, right? They still carry a life of their own. And attention to that, to those, that kind of residual or minimal forms of difference can help us explain whether we arrive at you know, landscapes characterized by glistening IT hubs and real estate expansion, or panchayat capitalist development partnerships, or indeed violent forms of dispossession that we've seen in the past, or, or even you know, resurgent forms of ruralism that we've witnessed uh, in, in Punjab and Haryana over the recent years. Right? So we need to try to attend to that conjuncture of an urbanization without guarantees uh, that produce geographies of accumulation, but also compromise, failure, and alchemy. Okay, so that's my theoretical methodological approach. Um, I'll move on. So in the remainder of the talk, I just want to give you three examples of what I mean by agrarian city making in practice. So the first uh, is uh, a body rontierism. This is something that I discuss and explore in the first two chapters of the book. And those of you who are uh, aware of Sushmita Pati's work, will be kind of familiar with this kind of geography. So in Gauguin, the, the, the development, uh, the planning legislation that opened up agricultural land to the market in the 80s, uh, 
exempted the rural, uh, the village residential homesteads, the Abadi Day, from, land, from the land market, from the urban jurisdictions until around 2012, 2015, all villages uh, in Gurgaon were under panchayat governance uh, and development and planning regulations. What's really important to say that while I understand this is a key territorial compromise, one that said to farmers, we're going to buy up your land, but you can keep your uh, kind of traditional residential homesteads. So it is since opened up land while not tearing the entire social fabric of the village apart. It is dependent and hitched upon a history of colonial land settlement that has consolidated land within the hands of dominating, dominant agrarian caste communities already, right? So this, ter this territorial compromise, these exemptions, are exemptions for dominate, dominant uh, communities. Traditionally, this is a map on the top left of, this is a master plan map, all these red dots are villages. Gurang has lots and lots of villages. Traditionally, those who are not members of that dominant uh, uh, agricultural caste, as the British um, legally tied them with, uh, reside in land outside the Abadi, right? So those, those communities are not within that kind of historical bind, uh, kind of binding of a property personhood, and as, as, as a result, are subject to uh, forms of dispossession that we would characterize perhaps elsewhere, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So one of the really interesting things for me, and the, part of this research was conducted as an ethnography across three village clusters in Gurgaon that included a, a household survey of around 200 uh, households. And I looked at the ways I looked at sort of when their land was sold, what they did with their income, what they then, what they sort of transitioned to since their land was sold to developers. And so around the 1990s, uh, pretty much en masse, the landowners in Gurgaon were beginning to reinvest their incomes drawn from land acquisitions or sales into the development of mass low-income housing within uh, within the Abadi Day. You have to remember the Abadi Day is held on a collective, non-individuated community customary title at this point. It's actually gonna change soon. Um, so they're mobilizing a customary form of landed property to develop iteratively this form of low-income housing within a context like Gorgan that has no institutional history of low-income low, low housing provision. It's almost exacerbated in Gorgan because of the dominance of private actors. There's also very little public land in Gorgan. So the traditional housing arrangements of the working class, of the urban poor, are, if, if you like, fixed to the Abadi, fixed to the urban villages in Gorgan. This performs a really vital function for subsidizing industrial production in the city, right? Um, if you've ever wondered why Gorgan has some of the most high, highly valuable land in India, rubbing shoulder to shoulder with a, an economy that relies on low wages, really, really low wages, the urban villages sort of fix that particular economic contradiction. Also, in doing so, has generated, as I alluded to earlier, this new rentier class among landowners within uh, the Abadi Day. And this gen broadly maps onto their existing kind of land holdings pre-land uh, acquisition or sale. And what I trace across the book is how um, these new rentier landlords in the villages begin to mobilize themselves collectively through either through that kind of sharehold, land shareholding model that they hold agricultural land on, or through the panchayat, or through caste associations like the Yadav uh, Mahasava. And they begin to recycle the rents that they're accruing in villages like this, in tenement housing, into real estate investments outside the village. So you see the village then. Play, play, playing stage to this recycling of wages, rents, capital that are producing these new kind of emerging rentier classes. And I study in the book a little bit about how this is producing fractures. Of course, it, the, the original fracture is between the dominant ag agricultural communities and those who have been historically dispossessed of their land. This kind of a body rentierism is producing fractures within uh, landowning communities themselves, between those who can really mobilize huge amounts of rent uh, to buy up, for, for, to invest in shopping malls or to buy up agricultural land on the edges of the city, and those who are kind of um, reserved to the more like petty, petty forms of frontiership within the village. 
I think just to, to zoom out from the, to, I mean, there's lots to say about Abadi on terrorism. And one of the chapters actually looks really at the way, the kind of labor regimes that exist within the tenements, how they produce a particular form of hypermobile flexible worker and a particular form of urban politics that emerges out of these tenement villages. But one of the interesting things I wanted to draw attention to is within mainstream accounts of urbanization, the elimination of customary landed property is usually seen as a prerequisite for development. So we have this kind of canon handed down to us that is drawn from the, the enclosures movement in England, which views uh, customary land and customary rents as a, a key obstacle to development. In Gugan and I would argue elsewhere, we see precisely the opposite, right? It's precisely the maintenance of customary property monopolized by a dominant growing community that is enabling the expansion of real estate markets. I'll leave it at this. Okay, so the second sort of iteration of agrarian city making I wanted to draw attention to really uh, uh, sort of focuses on how these village com committees, investment um, groups emerging from these tenement villages begin to situate themselves and impl implicate themselves in the project of land assembly, aggregation, and conversion. So what's, as I mentioned before, what's unique about the Gauguin model is that uh, what, if it, under state development models, the state can issue an eminent domain order, a compulsory acquisition order, and acquire land en masse. In Gauguin, real estate firms have to engage with each and every landowner. And you have to remember, land in Gauguin and Haryana, and I assume elsewhere, is held under a kind of shareholding system where one parcel of land might be owned by 20 different families who own a different, have possession of different parts of that land. And these firms don't really have any uh, good practical knowledge of these of land and land tenure systems and institutions. So you see here, and I kind of trace in this chapter of the book, uh, the ways that uh, ag 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 agrar agrarian communities sort of vest themselves in, in these spaces and conduct the messy work required to clear land of all of its encumbrances and transform it into an asset. And in the first instance, this takes place in a, in a quite straightforward way. Um, uh, small uh, village groups will work as aggregation companies for someone like a big developer like DLF, acquire the land, process the paperwork, or they, a process they call clear, cleaning or clearing land. And in fact, many of the development licenses in Gauguin held by a, a developer is actually held under the name of an agrarian, of a, of a land, aggregate, and land aggregation company who are kind of legally affiliated with the developer. This is a kind of straightforward way that this kind of um, work takes place. <clears throat> there is a second, though, uh, probably more common uh, iteration of this, and that's where groups tend to go it alone. They sort of speculatively buy up land on the peripheries of the master plan or nearby anticipated sites of state land acquisition um, in expectation of rising land values or state compensation. And finally, the third iteration, and so, uh, sorry, I should say about that, that you can see that kind of speculative project across the landscape of Gauguin. So you can see kind of flattened fields with one uh, piece of land that's being, that's being cordoned off that have, that have basically refused to sell, or highways that are being rerouted around a particular pitch of land. Um, so in the book, I talk about this guy who owns, who ba he basically buys up bits of land and turns them into nurseries, into like plant shops, and sort of holds on to them as much as, as as long as he can before then selling, before selling them on or, or taking the compensation, whatever. The third iteration of this practice um, is the kind of speculative construction of houses, boundary walls, and roads on village common lands, panchayat lands, and open lands, which is always a practice aimed toward refashioning the land, no matter of its legal status, into something that resembles real estate uses in anticipation of uh, regularization or land use change. And you see this, this is really an example of how kind of ambiguous land tenure arrangements can be mobilized uh, and can be sort of, and people can make sort of physical possession claims within those spaces. And these kinds of speculative plotting practices, I would argue, A, kind of are driving much of the kind of peripheral urbanization of the city. Well, they're also guided and driven by many state technologies of planning, which themselves are quite speculative. 
So pl the, pl the master plans that are constantly being redrawn in, in, in Gulgaon. I think that across the 2010s, there was like four urban master plans, not including the drafts. In a sense, call upon, they re-envisage re agricultural land as uh, in this kind of expanding geography as residential or commercial land. And they call upon these kinds of actors to engage in this kind of speculative investment and plotting of land. To give you um, a quick example, uh, part of chapter, this is all cut, comes from chapter three of the book. There's an area in Gulgaon, kind of in, it's not a very good map, but this kind of blue dot in the bottom right, called Gualpahari. Um, that's kind of in the armpit of Gulgaon, Fridabad, and Delhi. So it's a really interesting area, a very beautiful area um, on the side of the hills. And here there's around 400 acre land, 400 acres of unconsolidated common lands. It's, it's common lands, but it's also, it's privately owned, but it's got common use of rights on it. And on that land, uh, different institutional actors have plotted development since the 1980s. So you'll find small bungalows, boundary walls. I think part of that land is occupied by uh, a special economic zone now. Panchayat have claimed some of that land. And in 2010, this body of land was incorporated into the Gualpahari development plan. And there's been this, since then, this struggle between the different actors, each who have vested possession claims on that land, um, over the kind of real meaning and use of that land. Thanks, Suri. And part of that's because it's now worth so much money. And when, um, in my conversations across my research with the, these kind of plotters and speculators uh, and um, actors who have built or made claims on this common land, all the conversations were sort of saturated with a discourse of anticipatory development driven by a shared understanding that the common sense use of that land is for real estate, no matter its legal standing. Their investments would be honored because they look and feel like, um, um, they look and feel, I would say, modern, but also because the person making that claim is from a dominant agrarian community. I've just given you this example because it's quite, I, I find it quite uh, telling. So on the top, you have this uh, remark by a broker that, you know, this is kind of a remark that you probably find in urban spaces all over the, all over the place. But it's like, you know, the, as long as there's a pucker road here and we have some paper uh, and we have the proper house built, the paperwork will follow. No one wants to get rid of this. This is development. The second is a quote from the, the Punjab and Haryana civil court judgment, which was a judgment on this dispute, a dispute concerning who has the right for use of that land. And, it, uh, and, it, and the, the judge uh, remarked that, it's essential that everyone in society realize that a 460-acre grazing ground, a commons, is not required in the heart of the national capital region. So you can see how these speculative um, practices that the agrarian communities are vested in are also driven and kind of work hand in hand with the kind of speculative discourses uh, and technologies that are used by the state. In this sense, while kind of a lot of the dominant literature would uh, prefigure urban expansion as something being driven by kind of formal state planning technologies, in Gulgaon, what I tried to discuss in the book is the ways that agriculturalists are, are in part the point men of this expanding urban frontier. They're using their local knowledge, their position within what uh, Vinay Gudwani's recently called like the land assembly line. Um, and their, their knowledge of these kind of ambiguous tenure forms to state claims and expand uh, uh, real estate markets in the city. So very finally, the final area that is drawn from chapter four of the book, and it's here that I examine how the processes of land conversion are provisionally settled, directed, and sometimes subverted within the land revenue bureaucracy. This is a part of the book which was drawn from about eight months of ethnography of just sort of sat in the Patwari office in central Gulgaon. This is the office uh, which is a central authority for all agrarian property holdings. And it's here that all legal mutations, partitions, consolidations in land take place and are authorized. So it's a really interesting site because you'll, if you sit there long enough, you'll find uh, you know, brokers from Donald Trump's real estate firm, but also just guys coming in to get their paperwork, author, their um, Aadhaar card signed and things like that. Um, 
In the book, I explore how actors embedded in the office mobilize ambiguities in land records um, to remap boundary lines, to make property claims, and in some cases, disrupt land assembly proceedings. The capacity to do so is not, I argue, a process or effect of bureaucratic corruption, but rather is an outcome of a core disjuncture between the lively, way, lively and kind of heterogeneous ways that land is held and used, and um, the more synoptic and disconnected modes of mapping and recording property um, in the city. So what I find quite interesting, you know, in, in if you think of a typical um, kind of vision that urban planning technologies um, uh, understand cities through, it's like future oriented, oriented right? It's, but a speculative technology. The revenue bureaucracy understand and record land through in a disaggregated uh, and, and non-commensurate forms of uh, register. So you have the maps and the textual register, and then you have the actually existing development on the ground. And they're all slightly at odds. They don't necessarily align with each other. And the work of the patuari, the work of the revenue bureaucrat and the surveyor in the field, is to bring these different registers of property together, to align them in order to provisionally settle a property claim. And it's in these spaces of ambiguity that you find both kind of high-end real estate firms, but also kind of more local agrarian communities making property claims. Have I got an example? To give you a quick example, so while I was doing this research, I went on lots and lots of land surveys. And land surveys were called if you wanted to aggregate a, a, a bunch of fragmented land holdings, if you wanted to partition them, so if you wanted to separate your land, or so if you wanted a, a judge, um, uh, uh, if you wanted to arbitrate on a property boundary dispute. And typically, we would use survey stones that were laid by the British and then relayed actually in post-colonial periods. But frequently, we'd be frustrated by these disjunctures between what we saw in the map and what we saw on the ground, but also by the the kind of iterative destruction of survey stones and the, move, and the moving about of survey stones, which has been a kind of principal way that um, communities have, have been able to kind of disrupt development proceedings. If you can move a stone around or destroy a stone, then it kind of delays, delays a survey. And so what we would frequently do, and this is a kind of one example of that, is use the actually existing landscape of the city as a reference to arbitrate on a property boundary. In that sense, there is a kind of provisional working operation through which, property is, that through which property is settled, which relies on, not on kind of the legal or kind of formal codes of property ownership, but on their actually existing development. And you know, there are lots of examples of this um, that I can go into. You know, there's a, a, a case I talk about in the book of a village that had to shift 50 meters east because of this new residential tower that had been built and we did this survey over and over again, but we couldn't get a result that didn't shift at 50 meters. So we just said that people just decided we're not going to do this survey. Let's just don't come back. And so they kind of agreed to be kind of forever slightly at odds, forever at a disjuncture from the, from the formal record. I should also add that as digital technologies are being introduced into the fold, these disjunctures have been magnified in many ways because there's been this proliferation of mapping. Every time you map a piece of land, produces slight disjunctures, slight differences. And that those dis differences, those ambiguities, allow people to make uh, claims on property. Um, they also, digital technologies are very precise, so that even in their precision, they produce certain forms of ambiguity. So, so broadly speaking, this chapter really argues that the negotiability of property as it's kind of understood and recorded within the revenue bureaucracy acts as a resource for a wide range of actors to provisionally settle property claims in ways that both shape mainstream real estate development and shape the kind of spatial fabric of the city, at, at, often at odds with urban planning technologies, but they also afford local actors space to challenge urban development agendas to disrupt or delay acquisition proceedings. And again, you see this in the fabric of Gorgon. You see these disjunctures, these uncertainties. Um, just to conclude then, what I've tried to, to, give, to kind of elaborate on today, just provide a snapshot of kind of what I mean by agrarian city making, and then give you some examples of how 
the articulation of the urban and the agrarian both enables forms of kind of what we might think of as hegemonic forms of urban real estate development, but also uh, provide its limits. They provide its points of uh, disruption um, of what Vinay Gudwani uh, refers to as contamination. I think, uh, so in more practical terms, I think it's important to attend to these complex articulations because if we want to make, uh, primarily because if we want to understand these kinds of geographies, we have to understand these kind of political and provisional grounds upon which they're made. Secondly, I think, you know, if you want to make an intervention in Gurgaon, say if you want to make a policy intervention in Gurgaon, you need to understand, you know, if you want to make a housing intervention, you need to understand that low income housing is hitched and dominated by this territorial compromise in the village. You need to understand that there are already existing iterative processes of low-income housing development that take place in the city. If you want to understand the kind of spatial and planning fabric of Gurgaon, you have to understand that there are other optics, other registers through which property is assembled and property claims are made. And that's kind of what I'm trying to explore in, in, in the book. I think I'll leave it. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, there's lots and lots here, and we have, we have a good 20, 25 minutes uh, to discuss. And so just before I open it up, uh, I encourage folks online to put their questions into the Q&A now. Um, let, let me get us started. I think I'm, I'm really struck by one parallel to what you're saying, right? So in Delhi in 1959, we have this great experiment where all the land around the urban Ooh. villages in the city is acquired for the basis of the first city master plan, right? And here's a story about the acquisition of agricultural land leaving the Abadi Day free again. In Delhi, the story is a post-colonial, immediate independence, socialist experiment of state acquisition of land to keep out the DLFs, which is why they went to yeah, Gurgaon. which is why they left. Right? Yeah. Which is why they couldn't come in. And in Gurgaon, the story you're telling us is actually a story where that exact process is then done by private acquisition. Right? Yeah. And, and you're pushing us to see this private not as big capital private, but these grades of different kind of agrarian actors that are not getting displaced or written out of this story, like yeah. you're saying, right? You're reminding us they're still dominant caste actors, right? But at the same time, there is... This, there isn't this sort of easy replacement, displacement, accumulation kind of narrative. Yeah. But, you know, this morning, some of us here were discussing Teresa Caldera's peripheral urbanization, yeah. you know, and this idea of the patchwork that gets created when people plot and make boundary walls, yeah. occupy land and build informal settlements and build unauthorized colonies and build favelas, right? So. There is, an, there is an odd way in which I'm sort of seeing these two processes 50 years apart with <laughs> yeah. different actors, yeah. both playing with this idea of what was agricultural land, both saying the urban village is no longer the farmer but the rentier, right? Yeah. And so partly, just as a provocation, one of the arguments that Caldera makes is that that history of auto-construction in cities of the South through was a history of peripheral survival mm, and, and yeah. people carving out life in the city. This is still a story of accumulation in some way, right? Yeah. So partly I wanted to say, though, is she said that that process led to patchworked and unequal cities, a kind of, it, it created forms of an inequality. You've used the word uneven many times yeah. here. You've used the word patchwork many times here. I suppose I'm partly saying is, at the end of this, if you look back from the particularities of the argument, what kind of urban have we produced here? Like, yeah. what, is, what kind of city have we made? Is this, yeah. is this a relatively equal city where there's been a dispossession of a certain kind, but also the creation of a new bourgeois class? I mean, these dominant agrarians may be dominant caste, but they're not global capital elite players. No, this yeah. is not DLF, right? Yeah. Is this an unequal urbanism? Is this unevenness? Also, uh, is this a good city? Is this, I mean, what's the, you know, what is the quality of the urban that this process of building yeah. creates? Yeah, I mean, I've not met many people that think Gauguin is a good city, and I struggle to get friends to commute down to, to see. But I think, yeah, I think you're, 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 
Absolutely right. I think what's different to take the first point about Delhi and Gurgaon is the particular conjunction that they're in, that they're they're kind of located in. Uh, the, this model, this Gurgaon model in Haryana, was led by these quite entrepreneurial Congress politicians, Bajan Lal, Bansi Lal, who were really who saw themselves as like prototypes of the kind of liberalisation wave in the 90s. And this Haryana thing, um, this Gurgaon model, was re, was in part a kind of you, you might think of a kind of experimental stage. Um, but in Haryana, you can't. I don't think you. I don't. I think if they'd attempted to dispossess these communities en masse, the, po the political power that they hold, it just isn't possible. And so within that conjuncture of this kind of dominant agrarian, politically dominant, sort of socially dominant community, it's cast, cast alongside this kind of new market fervor, you get this kind of settlement that, um, that kind of works, that plays out differently in, 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 in Delhi and in Gurgaon and Lungaran. It's certainly not a socialist uh, project. I think in terms of, I, I draw so much from Teresa Caldera's work. And I think the difference, I think we just have a difference of, um, slight difference of focus. So what, what I'm trying to explore is, what I'm really trying to pick apart what real estate capital actually is and who those, what it actually means to convert land and turn it into something like real estate. So I don't see real estate capital as this kind of monolithic actor, but it's kind of internally uneven. It's internally um, negotiated, and it requires these sets of alliances and compromises. Um, and yeah, I think there, there are some, that's, I think there's certainly some currency in thinking about a model of greenfield urban development that attempts in some way to bring people on board. And you can, you can look at Gauguin as a way that that, and you see that all the time now, right? These land pooling schemes. Um, Amavati and all these other places where the project recognizes that we can't, we have to bring at least some people on board to this. What I find interesting about Gauguin is that that anticipatory dream that I kind of talk about here, it kind of is kind of fading, right? Because that material promise, the real estate state sector kind of faded away a bit. Um, the economy, because of the econ economic situation, many of these people who have really vested a lot of money in and, and kind of social capital and other, you know, they've invested a lot in this idea of being an asset class. It hasn't quite materialized. And it's happening right now. So I don't really have a good sense of where that could, what, what, what I sense is that this alliance is kind of breaking down a little bit. And some would argue that the kind of new political cultural wave is kind of picking that up and directing that resentment in particular ways. Um, I, there are people that write about um, Haryana that view these kind of the strikes in Punjab as a kind of pushback against this broken promise that Gauguin kind of ended up symbolizing. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's kind of... No, it's, a, it's a thought there. Ed, when you said that there's, there's two claims that I heard in your work that I find really interesting. The first is to speak against um, this sort of very dominant economic political economy narrative, yeah. right? And this idea that... So that there is such a, that the local is not just a play where demand, supply, land price intersects and the life changes, yeah, right? That, right it, yeah. that it's, and you know, Sushmita is here and in Sushmita's work, she had very similar challenges that then go back theoretically to say, and so this is, you know, the capital Q question yeah. is how can, if we take seriously that these brokers don't just navigate local messiness, right? They fix the patwari, they get the record yeah. right, they get your permission. But the value they produce is fundamentally different than the way we think of land markets and agglomeration economies, right? Yeah, yeah. So is there a way one can then begin to rethink this idea of the way we talk about land markets within economics, within that sense yeah. of political economy, right? That it's not just that we say, oh, look, these markets, because the typical dominant disciplinary response is what? If a market is messy, you need someone to clean it yeah. up and smoothen the right, right? Yeah, yeah. But you're saying they're not smoothening the right. They are the market. There yeah. is no other market but this, right? So yeah. how does one, from here, like you were saying, 
say, then look, as urban theorists, we should have different theories of political economy. Yeah. We should have different theories of value. This is, this is not a simply self-evident capitalism. That, yeah. So, you know, at the core of a lot of the urban is this relationship between urban and capitalism, urbanization yeah. and capitalism, right? And that's always been a sort of industrial North Atlantic yeah. theoretical story. So here's a not North Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. So is there a way then to rethink these so canonical notions for us, like land value, political economy, yeah. agglomeration. Yeah. Are you beginning to sort of go in that direction? Yeah, I think, I mean, the one that really comes to mind is, uh, and it speaks to Sushmita's work actually as well, is this, um, in, 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 in American, in Europe at the minute, there's this kind of frenzied debate about rent and rentierism and like, all the companies now are, they don't produce anything, they just extract rent, right? And then, so, Capitalism is over. We just rent now. We're just kind of feudal serfs um, to our tech companies or whatever. That kind of historic historicity only makes sense from Europe because, you know, capitalism has always been rentier here in some way, right? There's always been a far more complex articulation of economic and social forces. Um, so my work is, in a sense, trying to to, to re provisionally center. I don't want to center anything. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as I said, a more disaggregated uh, um, and uh, uh, political economy. So my work is, in, in a way, engaged in political economy, but I, I guess takes a more cultural political economy approach to, tr to try and understand these actually existing combinations um, which, which form the political grounds, of, kind of political and cultural grounds for capital, capitalism or whatever to take place. I think it's far more an interrogation of that than necessarily the urban, I think, in my, in my sense. That makes sense. I have a lot more to ask, but I'm going to begin to open it up, and I'm going to go back and forth between the Q&A and the audience. Um, so anytime, folks, just raise hands if you need me to come to you. And let me start with a question in the Q&A. Um, so this is Matt's question, says, thanks, Tom, fantastic work. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of infrastructure roads, light rail, even water in these forms of urbanization. Yeah. Um, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so I think um, a few things to say, I think. Like, um, I think infrastructure plays a really important role in pulling some of those speculative ge geographies around. Um, so highways, for example, in Gurgaon and, and that kind of broader region have become really interesting sites for these kinds of contested property making practices. They, the highway, in, in, in some ways, uh, directs many of these speculative investments in agrarian investing because it, they, they look at the highway, people look at the highway and they see like value arising from its, mm. from its, uh, from its sides. Um, so and and sort of infrastructure, those kind of highway politics has been a really, um, uh, fervent space of land pol uh, land struggles, I guess, land contestation in Gurgaon over the uh, last uh, over the last decade. I think in terms of kind of urban infrastructure, one one of the things uh, about Gurgaon is that it's never really had a consolidated public infrastructure body, yeah. uh, and because of the planning regulations, um, I mean, that's not to say that I mean there are actually lots of cities that don't follow this private model that have never had. Public, publicly consolidated infrastructure systems. Um, but I think this, in many ways, this kind of privatized model of, and this kind of enclave model of infrastructure delivery is another area that lots of agrarian communities uh, in, uh, work in, right? Because they're the ones digging the holes, they're the ones provide, uh, doing the kind of supply chain of water. So this kind of privatized model is also one that enrolls the kind of economic fortunes of, of, of these villages. Flo, somebody? Hmm? Let me take one more from the Q&A while the flow warms up. Um, so the second question here, Tom, is this saying that when land values were lower, the, que the question is asking, that they were a different kind of buyer-seller transactions. Yeah. And many new actors entered the area of land assembly as the values increased, right? So not sort of locally embedded, but you have a set of people who begin to get drawn to the Gurgaon story, yeah, yeah. right, and try to enter in. And the argument here is that there was a kind of 
distancing of the developer from the landowners. You mentioned this in your talk a little bit, that actually the developer stays one step behind through a separate private company that yeah. does the aggregation. The aggregation is actually done by the agrarian yeah. you know, actors and agents who are also part of these landowning companies in some way. So the lines between who the developer is, who the owner is, who the actor is, and that in some way the developers, this I like this idea of aloofness, that the private developer yeah. is also saying, you know, I don't want to get too close to this kind of <laughs> aggregation story, right? Yeah, and yeah. The first time I ever heard the word land aggregator, um, it was really funny because, you know, in, in early days of a lot of this question of occupation and assembly in tension with the law, like the guy, yeah. like your broker Prem said, right? They won't destroy this. It looks good. Yeah. Eventually, it will become legal. This yeah. is sort of post facto application of the law that many Southern urban theorists talk about, right? Yeah, yeah. But this idea that, um, you know, at that point, we used to just say they were, you know, they were dalals and slumlords. Yeah, yeah. And, and land aggregator was the first time I was corrected, yeah. translated into English and said, actually, I'm a land aggregator. Yeah, yeah. And it gave me a sense that there was a different kind of sociological actor of foot. <laughs> yeah. speciality was in, in this, yeah, right, in yeah. some way. So, this sense that the aloofness of the developer, this new set of actors that enter to mediate, to yeah, yeah. capture value. Yeah, I think when I first, in my naivety, when I first started doing research, I would use the word Dalal a lot and mm. uh, didn't quite realize why people so so angry at me. So I quickly stopped using that term. Um, but I mean, yeah, I think there are degrees of separation. Uh, but having said that, this stuff that I'm talking about, the the firms know it the best. They know that they have to deal. They, you know, if 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 urban theory comes with this kind of rather pompous understanding of what uh, urbanization looks like, these firms know that it's not like that. These firms yeah. know that we we're going to have to hire a liaison to sit in the Pituari office, uh, and we need to find one that maybe used to be a Pituari or whatever. They they have a much more practical and working knowledge of the the kind of assembly lines. Uh, the mediators and brokers that are required in order to do this work. So there might be some structural um, distancing. I mean, the other, the other um, kind of more newer phenomenon is that you, there are some like big development firms that come from the region now. So these kind of emerging set of actors who, I don't know how modest they're, that they at least they play up the modesty of their upbringings or their backgrounds, who are now kind of big players in the development in the kind of real estate sector. Um, so I, I get a sense that they really do know. The, the one, the, the kind of the historical trajectory that I notice a lot is actually in um, buying up industrial plots. Seem to be in Gurgaon the very first kind of move towards land speculation. So in very early on, when land values were, were quite low, the, this area around Cyber Hub, but lots, lots of that, those plots were bought by villages from Dundahira, Kapasira, and these areas. Um, now they're incredibly valuable and they were they were nice training grounds because of there were additional rules about what you can do with industri uh, industrial plots um, you know you can't just immediately flip it you you have to have production going on it and things like this so that seems to be in my experience a kind of little a bit of a training ground for what was to become uh, later on thank you Sebastian. Uh, hi, Tom. Thanks hi. so much for the talk. It was so interesting. Um, I actually wanted to hear a little bit more from you about the word frontier that you use yeah. also as a part of this thing. And from everything that you told us and, you know, how you sort of unpacked this, you know, almost like this relational geography that is emerging and is in the making. And, you know, you sort of highlight the subaltern piece of that relational geography that's emerging. Now, using the word frontier within this yeah. is also sort of, I think, quite an interesting intellectual provocation. But the frontier is not out there. In some ways, the entire city is a frontier to, the, to Delhi. Yeah. But the frontier is also very much within the geography of the city itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the idea of frontier that you worked with in your book. Yeah. And also, I mean, again, maybe I'm sort of um, expanding a little bit on the idea, but I also sort of heard in sort of the process based you know, descriptions that you gave us that the frontier happens not just once. Yeah. The frontier is also sort of a process, and the frontier emerges many times through the process. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about like some of the ideas that went through your head when you were using that particular terminology. Yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I think I find Frontier, the Frontier useful in the sense that it, yeah, it has these kind of multiple meanings and it's, it's that frontiers are not geographically faithful, right? They move around and they're responsive to particular unevenness of development. In Gauguin's case, there is this kind of ideological frontier. There was this construction of Haryana as this barren, backward, um, empty space that once markets were unleashed could, you know, uh, completely transform this site. Um, and so what I try and, what I try and uh, examine in the book is how this kind of idea of the frontier has, kind of has to match up with the kind of more material encounter with actually existing histories and institutions. And these, these in a sense, have to be smoothed over in, in, if, if that kind of frontier imaginary is to take place. So I think there's this ideological uh, work that's constantly be doing, be, taking place in Gauguin. It's in the kind of origin story of Gauguin too, right? If you read, if you have the pleasure to read K.P. Singh's autobiography, he's very frontiering. He's very like, I went down to Delhi and it was just a wasteland. And um, it was just nothing before I was here. And look what we've done. And so I think... Um, there's this work that the frontier does to cast everything beyond its reach as kind of out of control and, and monstrous and, and requiring um, requiring requiring some form of discipline. And you and I yeah throughout the different parts of the book, I try and show how that ideological work is still kind of uh, present. Um, there's a kind of the first chapter of the book kind of goes over this like longer history of land settlement in Gauguin. Um, and there's a sense, uh, it, historically Gauguin was kind of developed as a, um, as a kind of backward region that was supplying inputs to the north of Punjab for the canal colonies. Um, and so you have this dual project during colonialism of, um, of the colonial rule uh, of creating property and, and binding it to the dominant agricultural communities, but also this kind of material wasting away of Gauguin. Um, and interestingly, in the 1920s, there was this thing called the Gauguin experiment, where this kind of rather outrageous British official was like, Gauguin's completely wasted, this isn't, doesn't look good for us. So he went around like teaching Gauguin these kind of civic virtues. Um, uh, you know, uh, he like made a film, which I'd love to see, about how people should uh, plot their land, shouldn't engage in pastoral activities. Um, so there's that kind of, and it was a complete failure, obviously, people are like, what are you talking about? But there's a kind of repetition of that in the Gauguin model, right? This kind of entrepreneurial, do-it-yourself attitude of kind of market, in, that, in the latter case, markets that can latch on to these uneven geographies, these uneven frontiers. Um, so yeah, in the, in the book, I try and look at like both this ideological work the frontier does, but also this kind of material... Uh, attempt to capture things beyond your reach, but your, your kind of your um, the necessity to su subsume parts of its logic. I think. But also, I mean, in some of what you're saying, the frontier is also that point where institutionally the law becomes fuzzy. Yeah. yeah. Where the the you know the property record can be adjusted. Yeah. Where yeah. the survey can simply not be done. Right. Right. Where yeah. Digital... Where like you know, the the urban master plan and the agrarian property record are not quite aligned with each other. And They're everyone can off. live with that misalignment. That, I mean, yeah, I thought it was really interesting when true. you said they decided they would just live with this <laughs> discord between the yeah. practice and the actual property record. Yeah. And, they see, and, some, and you hear that invocation a lot mm. in what defines this peri-urban frontier mentality, right? Where known lines become fuzzier, yeah, more yeah. negotiable. Though, it's worth the conversation because that's precisely the auto-construction history inside the center of the right, city itself, okay, right? Yeah, that yeah. all southern cities have always treated the law as something that can be managed as we go along. Yeah, yeah. Right? Eventually, we will catch up with it or it will catch up with us. And yeah, one of the yeah. two things will sort of happen. But <laughs> I'm going to... Sushmita, do you have the mic in your hand? Let me get to you and then I'll go back to the Q&A. Hi, thanks, Tom, Hi, for that uh, uh, interesting talk. Um, I was, as in, and you started your talk with talking about your earlier work where you started with labor geographies of Gurgaon yeah. and then eventually veered into agrarian urbanism. And now that this is your focal point of your work, how does that impinge on the labor question? How does this agrarian nature of urbanism uh, inform the nature of migration, inform the nature yeah. of labor and labor politics? Yeah. Thanks so much for asking that because it gives me opportunity to 
maybe. Um, yeah, so it started out as a project to explore these labor geographies. And so what, what I ex examine in the book is how the, the, these tenement economies, you have to remember that all this speculative endeavors all, is all hinging on the viability of low income housing markets, right? The viability of, of the wage. And so landlords take very seriously their role in, in the village, um, their role um, as kind of disciplinary actors for uh, uh, the kind of cir circuits of migrant labor. So I tried to look in the book about, uh, I tried to examine how the tenement becomes a site. Traditionally, we would, we would, we associate forms of labor market um, control and fashioning to the, to the factory or to the workplace. I think what I try and do is think about, take seriously these geographies of social reproduction in the village, which are so important to, the, to this land question, but are, not, but are often viewed as at odds. Typically, there's a kind of uh, teleological, you know, there's a kind of like a linear story, sorry, uh, where um, you have industrial cities and then you have post-industrial cities and there's, they move in one direction. As I was saying in the talk, that there shouldn't be a place for labor or for, for these kind of migrant labor work class within places like Gorgan. But it's the village and these tenement, tenement economies that are sustaining that. And so in chapter five of the book, I kind of try and explore the kind of regimes of the, the kind of daily life of the tenement and how that kind of produces a particular kind of mobility and a kind of uh, working identity uh, within, within migrant laborers. Uh, that, that are kind of permanently temporary residents there as they are in other, in other sites. In the final chapter, I try to, I, I follow um, a series of women-led uh, kind of political struggles in the city. So a union drive uh, and then two factory occupations that were led by women just as I was starting my research. What I find interesting about these claims is that unlike male workers, in these tenements, who, are, who almost reify their mobility. They, they love moving, they're like, yeah, I get paid nothing, but I can go and get paid, I can go, I can leave whenever I want, I have that kind of freedom. Women don't have that in, in the ground, in these tenements, women can't move like, move like that. They're much more rooted in the city and they're rooted in these tenement structures that were entirely designed for mobility, entirely designed to keep people in motion, to keep people temporary. And that produces a particular kind of politics uh, a more uh, politics among these uh, uh, female uh, workers um, that you don't see, you don't really see it um, anymore in other spaces. Um, within that, I try and build a critique of the kind of subaltern urbanism literature, which um, I don't think attends quite enough to the gender dynamics of, um, of labor markets and how that might produce different kinds of claim making uh, within the city. Um, so that's how I kind of position the, really I see the village and this kind of rentierism as a kind of like a pin that kind of um, through which like wages and labor and all this sort of kind of circulates. Um, yeah. So I have time for one more question before I have to close. Let me take it from my apologies to a couple in the chat I won't be able to take, but let me take this last one. So the, I'll read the comment. It says, uh, thanks for the interesting work. I can see many common dynamics in the Lebanese context, whereby people started caring about common lands around Beirut when the first extension plans of the city were thought of. So my question is, how did this process of individual accumulation and transformation of farmers into investors affect what remained shared in the towns, particularly yeah. the public spaces and not only the commons? So yeah. what remains after you start plotting and closing and yeah. boundary wall making? That's really interesting. Yeah, and I think one, there's a kind of social tearing that you, if you like, that takes place when you start building boundary walls across what was existing uh, land that was used commonly, even across like traditionally in, in Haryana, across between brothers, right, where walls start getting built. And there's a kind of a chase because in within the Abadi is all possession, right? No one owns, no one has any uh, right to own a particular plot, right? So there's a rush to, to plot land in the Abadi and to make a claim. Um, and that is, 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 as I was kind of alluded to, is, is really tearing some of the kind of, creating huge amounts of resentment within the villages, um, which is, I think, awkwardly set against this kind of repeated assertion that uh, they too, uh, that, you know, that, that they too can, can um, make it big in the land market, right? That they see some of the larger land holding villages 
really dominate the space of the village, claim open space. So open space, ponds, um, are a really common site of, of tenement construction. Not really common, but they're a common site of tenement construction. Open land within the villages has been reclaimed. Um, and this is, make, this is affecting a real um, kind of a social uh, disjuncture within uh, a community that, you know, previously had been fairly uh, consolidated because of the property uh, legislation. What I think is going to be interesting, just to, as I think about it, so my new project is actually on this government scheme to issue property titles to the Abadi area. So just as my book was being released, I was like, the Abadi's everything. Uh, it's so important. Customary. Customary. Um, the Prime Minister announced, we're going to abolish the Abadi. We're going to get rid of it. We're going to give, we use these digital technologies to issue titles to everyone in the Abadi. And what that, and so, so there's this project ongoing, I'm trying to, to follow at the minute, of kind of imagining, of taking these kind of quite deep possession claims, which is, you know, build, this build, build, build up of, of tenement and low income housing, and to fix it into property records. And I think that's going to be um, a really interesting site and undermines the entire argument of my book. So it's a point of personal frustration. <laughs> We'll just move it from contemporary affairs to history. Yeah, and then yeah, in that yeah. way, it still has a, has a place in the archive. Yeah, yeah. But this is partly the question of what all forms of emergent peripheries are, right? That, yeah. that, that they are moving targets. Yeah, exactly. That they are, yeah. they are constantly, you said, constantly being made and unmade in some way. And yeah. I think in, in some ways, what remains, what traces of the Abadi remains, even past private property transformation. Yeah. But also, the fact that it is all well and good to want to translate the Abadi into private property. She's not the first person to have tried. Yeah, yeah. And definitely. many have failed at this altar. Yeah. There's also a way in which those collective historical customary forms of capitalism retain. Hold out. And yeah. will hold out and will yeah. find a way in the Patwari's office to not be so privatized. <laughs> yeah. Or not have that line be so clear. So yeah, yeah. I think it'll also be interesting to see how it plays out in that form if you take seriously like you're doing. Yeah. Which I think is such a great offering of this talk in the book to take these forms of the local construction of value and of capital and of land seriously yeah. as the market, not as intermediaries at all, actually, yeah. but as the market in itself. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining thank us you. here today. Thanks, thank you so much for folks who joined online and folks in the room. Um, and we will return you to your when, when what, what is, what, is it Wednesday? We will return you to your Wednesday night. Yes, uh, at this point, sorry, I have zero clue where we are. Um, thanks so much Dr. for joining you. us. Uh, thanks all everyone and good evening.